If you knew the devil, would you kill him? <laughs> Disagree the podcast. My name is Kevin Olenek. You can follow me on Twitter at K E V O L E. You can find me on Facebook, Kevin Olenek. You can like Agree or Disagree the podcast on Facebook as well. Uh, and you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our topic today is a bit of a sensitive one, and it has actually been a little bit of a while since I've done something not hockey related, so I'm feeling a little good about that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, near the end of this podcast, uh, some updates. But uh, our topic today is a bit of a sensitive one, but it's also a very important topic. The topic is around, we're talking about a little bit about abuse today. Uh, we probably all know someone that has been through that or have personally experienced that. Our guests today are presenting a show at the Vancouver Fringe Festival, which is another subpart of this topic that we will be talking about, called The Devil's Daughter. It will be at the Arts Umbrella on Granville Island, uh, coming up from the 5th of September till the 15th of September. Uh, it's called The Devil's Daughter. And our guest today are, is Melody Owen, who has been on for several other things, but she is the star of the show, producer of the show. She's having, showing a face of like, <laughs> moi? No, not me, but you are. That's surreal. <laughs> is that? Yes. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. And our, also our guest today is a public speaking coach and the director of the show, uh, and doing other things as well. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle Benson, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> We're actually in Danielle's apartment as we are recording here. Uh, so I'm grateful that they let me in. <laughs> you imagine. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's a... Uh, we're going to have the, the topic of this. Yeah, the title of the show is The Devil's Daughter. It was written and by Melody. Melody. So tell us why you chose to talk about this mm -hmm. or why you. Yeah, because I lived it. Hmm. I, I lived this. Um, I lived it and then I wrote about it and then I decided to perform it. Um, but to go a little deeper than that, I suppose. I originally wrote my memoir for myself, just as part of the process of retelling my story. Uh, abused children are told a lot of stories about them. They're told who they are. They're told, you know, they're worthless. They're unlovable. They're, you know, useless. They have a lot of stories told to them. And so at one point, several years ago, I decided to write my memoir, to write my own story from my perspective. And, you know, realizing that, you know, when certain things happened, you know, I did what I did, not because I was bad, but I was protecting myself or I was afraid or I wasn't strong enough to stand up for myself or other people yet. Um, and I've grown and, and now you know, none of those stories um, affect me anymore as much as they used to anyways. Um, but yeah, it, originally it was just me transforming myself. But then I started telling tidbits of stories in workshops, especially in Danielle's open mics and Danielle's workshops. And people were listening and people were interested and people wanted to know more. And so at that point I thought, well, I'll just, I'll write the memoir. I'll publish it as a memoir. And then at one point Danielle said, well, yeah, you could, but what if you performed it? And I thought, no, <laughs> but I don't know, somehow here we are and now I'm performing it. So I, you know, I went from writing it for myself to deciding to publish it as a memoir, which is now an editing to deciding to perform it at Fringe. And 
here we are. So why perform it, Danielle? What was what did you see? Well, Melody brought these these stories to open mic, and I think the first the very first one that made me think she should do it as a show was actually in one of our more intensive workshops, and we were doing a kind of d- describing a, a memory exercise, and she's so dramatic when she when she tells a story she, she doesn't just stand up there and go and then this happened and then this happened like she really she really dove into it and it was so physical and i could see the scene already and we actually did keep that scene uh, in the play which was really nice but um i could already see just from her telling that memory in the way that we were practicing in the public speaking workshop i could already see the play and so it was just kind of a no-brainer I may have talked her into it. I don't remember doing it, but I'm told <laughs> I'm told I uh, twisted her arm a little more than I meant to. <laughs> you definitely talked me into it. <laughs> was there something inside of you, though, Melanie, that maybe sug- thought in, in some ways that this was a good idea? All right. Mm, yes. Yeah. So if I think back to my childhood, uh, I think I spent a lot of time trying to perform to, you know, get people's attention, to get attention. So there might be a performer hiding inside of me somewhere. That is possible. I admit to that. Um, And so I guess when Danielle said perform, and and my first reaction, of course, was no, I've never done this before. I've never, I didn't even act in a high school play. Are you kidding me? But I think there is a piece of me that uh, enjoys performing and storytelling. And, And I have done storytelling. And so, you know, extending that storytelling to performing and some acting, uh, I think, yeah, no, maybe it was in me, if, for I, those, if I admit it. For, for those who don't know, and for those who do, Melody is uh, is the host, or how would you describe sure. it? You're the facilitator of the YBR Authors Group. Mm-hmm. So you do a lot of the interviews. So you interview a, a number of different people. From my perspective, and you guys can agree or disagree with me or not, but I think interviewing in a lot of ways is a form of performance. I think speaking is closer to performance than yeah. interviewing because interviewing and facilitation are much more about making space for the other person, whereas a solo show, it's all about her. Yeah. So I think, yeah, there's an element to it, but I, I also know that Melody's done a lot of public speaking, and I think that is more similar to the performance than at interviews because interviews are very much about getting something out of someone else, not not showcasing your story so much. Right. But they they're all they all overlap. Right. right. Fair. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Daniel, from your perspective, uh, I, I want a fun fact for those who don't know. I used to do some directing back in the olden days. Um, I also kind of directed some people that have never acted before. So tell us from your perspective what that is. Well, this isn't the first time I've directed someone who's never acted before. Right. I really love, if I can find the right person, I love directing non-actors. Because um, I also I also teach acting sometimes as well, and and voice for acting. But um, the thing with actors is, actors come with a lot of their own vocabulary. They come with their own process, which can be great. But especially when you have a larger cast, which we don't. It's just Melody, so it's wonderful. When there's a larger cast, that can become a bit of a problem because you're juggling so many different vocabularies. You're juggling different processes, and just trying to get everyone in the same play can be quite a challenge. Um, and I'm much more of a teacher director. I like to I like to get hands on. So I really like working with people who don't have any bad habits yet, and I can kind of mold them. <laughs> I'm an egomaniac. Uh, so you get to teach them that. your bad habits. Well, exactly. <laughs> and it's it's. I mean, professional actors are fantastic to work with. Um, of course, anyone who's got a good work ethic, and I, I mean professionalism, like has a good work ethic. Anyone who has a good work ethic is easy to work with. Um, Melody has an amazing work ethic, so she's been ridiculously easy to work with. Every now and again, we run into a like, oh, I don't really know how to explain that to a non-actor, and she has no idea what I'm talking about. So we, we'll have like little bits where we go, oh, okay, we need to navigate this. I don't really know how to explain this. But most of the time, she's she's got an amazing instinct for it. And, I, and maybe part of, this, of that is because it is her own story, and she did write it. So she's got a fantastic instinct for it. Um, for the timing and for the pauses and for the emotionality, there's very little I need to do. Um, it's more just kind of making sure we can see her face and, uh, you know, she doesn't blow out her voice, that kind of thing. Right. (laughs) Danielle's done a lot for me. She doesn't think, she says, oh, there's not much I've really done. She's done so much for me. This, 
I wouldn't know what to be, I wouldn't know what to do on stage if I didn't have her direction, which is why she's the director. But yeah, she's, she's given me a lot. I just, you know, just be before, modest. Before, okay. <laughs> but, and I think that there's an important element of this before we get into dive into this, what the play is about, about your two relationship, because it, for you, like you didn't hold any auditions for a director. You didn't, you know, you weren't like, hey, I need a director on the Craigslist or anything like that. And this is, because you're telling such a deeply important story, it was really, maybe, I think, I think your, I think we should discuss your relationship okay. because I do think that there's something significant between this that allows the story to be told mm -hmm. in the way that it is. I agree. Um, so Danielle creates a very safe space in her workshops, first of all. So the reason I could tell my stories way, way back then was because she created a, a safe space. And Danielle is very uh, consent based. Even now, like last night, we were in rehearsal and she said, I'd like to work on this scene a little bit. Would that be OK with you? I mean, she's the director and she's, you know, checking in with me like where I'm at. And we have a and we have a you know, she does this thing where she's like, so what are you in feedback today? What kind of feedback do you want? Where are you? Are you a 10? Are you a one? Are you zero? It's just, if you're taking her workshops or you're working with her as a client, it is the safest place to do that kind of, it, to do that work. It really, truly is. Um, and that, I have to say that is one of the reasons why she's my director. I knew I was safe. But at the same time, and this is really, really important, I've had feedback from other people. And because it's a traumatic story, a lot of people go, oh, you're so brave. And, and that's it. That's the feedback. They, because they, they get stuck on the, that's really hard to tell, good for you, they can't set that emotion aside and go, okay, but stand over there and do that and walk in this way. And where did you say the barn was? They, they can't do that because they, they get wrapped up in the emotion. Whereas Danielle gets wrapped up in the emotion, but can still consistently be there for me at the level I need her to be, be there for me, if that makes sense. That's a skill. I mean, we work together. Talent. We work together a lot, and I, I think um, we 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 had to do some paperwork we, to to see how long we'd been known each other the other day, and it's been almost ten years. We've known each other for almost a decade, so we've been working together a lot, worked together for most of that time, and we're both very detail oriented. And I think that is one of the key things to the success of our relationship, because having one person detail oriented and one person who isn't that makes it very difficult because someone's always holding back or, or someone's getting frustrated. Whereas we both have a very similar, I mean, you know, obviously I have to be careful not to overload her because this is her first time and she's working with a lot of, she's memorizing for the first time <laughs> and like doing all this deep emotional work. So I have to be careful not to over overwhelm her. But at the same time, I know that she cares about things to the same amount of detail that I do which allows me to do my job, which is really nice. But we've, we've been working together. Um, I've been coaching Melody for speaking on stage and on video for quite a number of years. So we already had that kind of going true. for us. That's yeah. so true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But everything I said still stands true. She's amazing at creating a safe space where, where you can, uh, you know you're okay. And I think, yeah, and I think for a lot of really sensitive topics, this is important. So let's get into the show, because now let's get into the sensitive topic. Tell us, tell us what it's about. Tell us a little bit about, yeah. So in my very early years, till I was about 10-ish, I grew up on a family beef cattle farm with my father, um, mother, I have a brother. Uh, my father is an alcoholic and... I mean, I don't know what the diagnosis is, but he has some sort of disorder. You know, one minute he's uh, friendly and laughing. The next minute he's a crazy man who wants to hurt you. Um, he, you know, killed animals. I mean, we're on a beef cattle. This sounds weird. So we're on a beef cattle farm. So obviously, you know, we're slaughtering cattle, right? And, and we're putting them in the freezer and eating them. But then he would also do things like give me a cat and it would have kittens. And then I would... He'd encourage me to train them and get friendly with them, and then he'd kill them in front of me. So he just did like some really, you yeah. know, serious psychological damage. Um, and I won't go into all the different levels of abuse, but that is, there's a scene about kittens getting killed in the play, which is why I bring it up. Uh, a lot of the abuse was uh, deeply psychological. Some of it was physical. Um, 
And so, the, you know, so those early years, which are your formative years, I, you know, was pretty messed up. My father sold the farm. We moved to the city. My mother walks out uh, about a year later and um, things happen. I become a very angry, you know, based on my childhood and the things that are happening. You know, my mom is leaving an abusive relationship. She's a mess. I just become an angry teenager and I get into lots of trouble. Um, and then at some point, um, something happens that shakes my world. And um, that's kind of the, the ending. That's, you know, I find out this, like, something happens and it shakes my world enough that I have to reevaluate. Um, but it's something about my father and it makes me so angry that I could kill him. I could really, I could have killed him. Um, what a horrible human being. Um, and so at that moment, I, I have to make a decision. Is this who I am? Am I going to follow this path? Because, you know, I was drinking like he was drinking. I was, you know, yeah, I wasn't afraid of him anymore because I was as violent as he was, right? I was, I could, I, you know, he was, I was as big as he was. I was strong. He was afraid of me by the end. Um, but then I had to make a decision and obviously I chose to not kill him. Um, and I changed who I was and I went on a different path. That's essentially what it's about. Hmm. without giving too much away you say obviously you chose not to kill him but as we discussed a little while ago you would have been out by now yes um, you're danger, so true so it's not uh, obvious that's true I would, <laughs> yes if I, I figured that out the other day if i had killed him i'd be out by now but still i wouldn't be who i am today no you wouldn't be who you are so that much i'll give away i didn't kill my father it, yeah it's the story of an almost murder that's an in the title it's not it's not giving anything away because it's in the title but i think this this story is very much about ownership and and owning the choices that you make i think that is the 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 biggest theme in the play is you know she comes from this background she's she's experienced this there's lots of things going on around her as well and she chooses to take ownership of her story and take ownership of the decisions that she makes and i think that's a it's a great message for everybody mm. so there's there's a few things that are coming to my mind here as you were talking a little bit. Um, I get the first one is from a writing perspective. Like I know that you chose to write your memoir, but the choice of writing and sharing some things, and there's probably some things that we are not going to ever know because that's part of your story and you don't have to tell it. That's right. So what made you choose? What to say and what not to say. In the memoir or the play? Both. Okay. In the memoir, um, and that's such a good question because I'm in editing right now, and it's one of the big topic with me and my editor, uh, because uh, there are certain people who I need to keep anonymous. Hmm. Uh, and it's very, very important that they remain anonymous. I need to honor their their choices in life, right? Um and so we've been talking about how to tell the whole story where I'm not holding back, yet I'm protecting the people who, who need protecting, who don't want their names in public. Um, and that those decisions haven't been finalized yet. I'm still working on that. In the show, what I did was I tried to pull out a theme. So there are lots of ways that, that my father was abusive. I pulled out the theme of killing animals as, as the one I chose uh, to run through the play. I could have chosen a number of abuse types of abuse as a theme, but I thought that if I threw in this type of abuse and that type of abuse, it's just messy, right? So I kind of, I created a thread that goes through the play. Um, and that was just, I think, I think killing animals for pleasure or to torture other people is pretty horrific. Um, so that's why I chose that. The whole play isn't about killing animals. No, just, no, just to be yeah. Clear. <laughs> and we are, and there are no killing of actual animals. It's during all the play. mine. It's yeah. all mine. And oh no, I would never yeah. kill an animal ever. <laughs> I I put spiders out of the house. I even kill them. Even the abuse that's featured in the play, the play isn't about abuse. No, the play is about Melody and her yes. journey. So it it does feature. It's definitely there, but it is not the majority of the play. Yes. The majority of the play is how this young girl is learning to navigate her way through life and mm -hmm. and figure out who she is as a person. It's there is definitely abuse in there, but it's not 
<laughs> it's not like 90% of the content. It's like no. maybe, maybe 40%, yeah. 30%, 40%. <laughs> and that's a good point because even my parents don't figure that strongly in yeah. the, like my parents are in the play and I refer to them, but it's not about them and the abuse. It's mm. far more about me and me navigating through my life to get to the point where I take ownership or responsibility for myself and move forward and move away from yeah. what was. Um, very good point, Danielle. It isn't, it, it isn't, I mean, it's, it's dark, but it's told lightly. Um, it's not all dark, right? And people will not walk out weeping, right? Or be horrified. And it's told from the child's perspective. So as an adult, you will see more than she does, mm -hmm. which is quite cool as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, how, the challenge directing that way from mm -hmm. you is that, and if, the, the biggest challenge was figuring out, and, and we, we really got into the highlighters for this, the biggest challenge was because we have Melody as a six-year-old, Melody as a 12-year-old, like, and Melody as a 16, 17-year-old, um, so kind of pre-teens, late teens, and child. And then we also have Melody the narrator, but sometimes we have Melody the narrator as she is now, and sometimes we have Melody the six-year-old, in a scene and sometimes we have melody the six-year-old narr narrating which is not quite the same so we we got a lot of different colors out mm -hmm. <laughs> um and just figuring out because we are doing just a nod just very subtle changes in in voice and body language just to indicate the different characters so keeping that clean is probably the hardest part of this whole play is who are you now <laughs> you're a teenager now now you're you now now you're you when you're a six-year-old and, and just making sure that that stays consistent and clean so that the audience can understand we're not time hopping it is told linearly but there is narration so right it makes it a little right. trickier so the audience at the fringe festival uh that's going to want to that's looking at this looking at your cover looking at your poster who who do you hope or expect that will be coming to this play i hope um i know a lot of people like thought-provoking theater like challenging theater at the fringe i hope they come because it is it's you know it's it's not just fluff like there is something really deep to it people who are looking for a hopeful story there's it's definitely a story of redemption um people who love solo shows because obviously it's a solo show and that, that's really one of the main things about fringe is, is that we get to do these kind of really minimal shows i think we have four props total um so you know we've got I just very... heard from the guy helping out with props. He's very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything fits. The entire show fits in one bag, um, which is great. And it's it's so it's, it's it's travelable in case you want to do it again. But it's yeah, it's very it's it's very minimal. It's very much based on the personality and uh, the engagement of the storyteller. And Melody is very charming, and she's very easy to listen to. She's very easy to relate to. So it's. It's very much a, it's not a, like a personality piece, but it's, it's storytelling, I think, at its best. Because there's a little bit of acting, there's a little bit of character, but there's a lot of just connecting with the audience and, and telling her story. And um, so people who are, are looking for something that isn't too heavy, that isn't too light, um, and kind of anything in between. But it is 14 plus, I believe, so no, no two young kids. Um, there is a little bit of language and that kind of stuff, so... I, my main concern is that people know that there are trick, there may be triggers in there for them, but we've done our best to, to let people know about that. Um, but yeah, I think I think most people who love the Fringe will love this show because I think this show is representative of what the Fringe is about. It's someone who's never done a show before. You know, it's that experimental feel of the Fringe, but she's worked really hard on it. It's a solo show. It's a personal story. It's a real personal story, which you see a lot at the Fringe. So I think I think most Fringe girls will love it. I think mm. so. Yeah. Thoughts? It's a personal story. So if you like personal stories, first and foremost, come for that. Like if you like mm. memoir, personal stories, if you like connecting with people, if you want to sit in the audience and feel connected to the person on stage and the story, then it's for you. Um, and I would say that if you like dark stories, but you also like to laugh, so it's, mm. it's, this, it's this play of... Uh, and it's a very small, intimate space. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a very small, intimate the uh, theater. Um, so if you like small, intimate theaters and you like to have that play of light and dark while you yes. go through a journey, um, then then this is this is the play for you. I'd say.
Okay. Uh, so so to, to unpack that part a little bit about the choice of light and dark and laughter and and all of that, did you, writing this or going through this process, is there stuff that you look back on that they were like, at this point, I, you know, I was really sad about this, but you know, I can look back now and laugh a little bit differently at it. Is there anything that you're looking back as like that you were at the time went through and went, oh man, this was, this was really, this was more, this was different when I looked at it now than it was when I actually went through it. Oh, absolutely. The, yeah. the distance, the distance uh, certainly helps you have better vision, right? To, to see things clearly for what they were. I, I see a lot of my past very differently than I did when I was in it and living it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's very, mm -hmm. yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And does it, uh, I'm tr trying to word these questions in a certain way, not to do that. I'm trying not to offend anybody. I'm just trying to make sure that I, I, I I'm getting across what I'm trying to say. And it, do you know, Sometimes with these kind of stories, I think that there's a perception from pe some people, not everybody, but some people look at it as a bit of like, well, you're sharing your story as a victim. Oh, no. And no, I, if, no, 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 no. I'm no victim. And if you know Melody, you know she's not. <laughs> and I she would no not victim. portray herself that way at all. But I am no victim. I, I Okay, so I'm going to, I think that there's, there's the abused, right? There's the there's the person who's being abused, and yes, they are victims. But then there's also the person who goes through life as the victim, and I actually don't think that's very helpful. That doesn't serve you, right? Oh, feel sorry for me because this bad thing happened to me. That's actually not a very productive way to go through your life. You're not going to heal. Um, you're you're not going to connect with other people. I think it's far better to look back and say, yeah, that happened to me and that wasn't my fault. It wasn't my responsibility, but those things, those things I did. And if I'd known better, I could have done better, mm. but I didn't. And now I know better and now I can do better and I can move forward right. with the lessons that I've learned and own, own everything that I need to own. I think walking through life as a victim is, uh, it's, it's, it's a form of suffering, mm. sadly. And I think, and maybe, maybe consciously or not consciously, I don't know, but maybe even making this play and, and the message of this play, but even the, the, the purpose of the play for you is a bit about taking ownership of the healing process. Like, obviously you have no control over what happened to you, but the healing process can be something that you can be selfish about. It's something that you can really, really own and really move through. And I think maybe, I don't know, we haven't really talked about the purpose of this play on an emotional level for a melody in her life. But I imagine that sharing your story can be a, a way to, to work through healing as well. I, I'm always healing, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't think all of the trauma will ever be fully gone. There are things that still trigger me. I still, sometimes something will happen and I will, mm -hmm. I will enter into that state of, Oh my God. Right. Um, people around me don't normally notice or know what's happening. Uh, because I am fairly far into the healing process. But I think that when you've had a lot of trauma, I think you're, I think you're always healing. I think there are always pieces. It's interesting you chose to use, you use the word healing and not healed. Hmm. I, I, because I, I would imagine, like, for, for people who are dealing with this topic in whatever way that it is, I think it's always healing. Yes. It's not healed. No, healing is a journey. Yeah. Right. You don't, it's like anything in life. There's no, you know, you, there's no, oh, I'm going to get there. It's, it's all a process. It's all a journey. There's no, there's no final destination necessarily. Right. It's part of healing is part of my growth and my development as a human being. And I hope it continues to, to go on. Right. I hope I continue to heal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Now, the other part of this that we don't talk a lot about in our culture um, but sometimes people make choices and those choices are not, are, are damaging. And there are going to be people in this audience 
that have done that. They have been an abuser. What would you want to say to them? Yeah. Um, I think that mm, people who have been abused have the potential to become abusers. I think that's just, that's just part of, part of the way things work. Um, my father was an abuser. I believe he was abused. I don't believe that he just was, uh, you know, a rotten egg and he was born evil. I don't believe that. I think something happened in his life that shifted him in some way that made him who he was. Um, I don't know what that was. I, I'm suspicious. I, you know, I suspect certain things. Um, and so if, you know, and, and I myself, you know, I, I grew up, I have like zero parenting skills. My parents were not great. I have children. If I had not taken responsibility for my life and been on the healing journey, I could have easily uh, resorted to my parents' tactics for parenting. And I'm not suggesting in any way I'm a fabulous parent. I'm not. I've made lots of mistakes. Um, I tell my kids, I'm sorry I ran out of tools. Like I just don't know how to parent right now um, because I'm human and I come from abuse. I come from trauma. But I keep working at it and working at it and working at it. So I think we can all, who, all of us who have been abused have the potential to become abusers. The difference is, as, as Danielle said earlier, ownership. I was abused. Then I started drinking and then I started hitting my kids. And now I want to take ownership of that. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to get, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell somebody that, that I, that I, um, that I did something and I'm going to get help. I'll give you an example from my own life. My oldest daughter, and it's funny, she has no recollection of this story at all. I'm still completely traumatized. <laughs> One day she was a young teenager and she was being just awful and she called me a bitch and my reaction was to slap her across the face and then I stopped and thought oh my god what have I done we went to therapy immediately I went to a therapist and I said I have done this I feel awful and she said it's okay you're human let's do some therapy and I did therapy with my oldest daughter and we we went through this therapeutic process to figure out where we were going wrong, uh, where I could parent better. And I became a better parent. And now I talk about it. She's like, I have no memory of that at all. And I'm like, Oh good. Cause I'm still traumatized. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but there's an example, right? How easy it is when you come from trauma to, f to fuck up. And what do you do when you, what do you do when you make a mistake? Instead of continuing down that path, you go, Oh my God, I messed up. You go to your community. And you need a good community. So if you need, you know, if you need a good community, find your good community. Tell them that you've made a mistake and, and, and learn from it and grow from it. That's all we can do as human beings. So if you're, you know, if you're an abuser, if you're out there and you're an abuser and you don't want to be an abuser anymore, ask for help. Walk into a counselor's office, you know, walk, you know, walk into your community, whatever it happens to be, and just say, I really want help. I don't want to be who I am anymore. I want to change. I want to be a better person. And, and I think if I can go on a little bit, I think, it's you, you know? I think that's what, for me, forgiveness is based on. So I've never forgiven my father for what he's done because he, he's never stood up and said, this is, this is what I did. This is what I did wrong. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's being charged, he's being convicted, he has done his time, um, yet he r still runs from it. He still runs from all of the responsibility he has in the part he played in damaging so many people. Um, and I can't forgive that. But if he turned around and said, I don't want to be this person anymore, I would be okay, what can we do? And from there, we might be able to find forgiveness. Hmm. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> no, it's, it's give me ask me a question on that and i just go i could i could talk about this f forever this is a really important topic well yeah and i i mean i think it, you know on the topic of forgiveness i i do believe as a society and we have i'm going to be controversial maybe a little bit controversial here but i think that this is true i think that there's been an expectation for the victims of those that uh, been abused in some way shape or form however it is to forgive mm. 
and that's not as easy as we make it out to be. And you have every, you can interrupt me. You were going to say well, something. I, yeah, I just, yeah, I didn't want to cross talk. But um, I think also there are multiple definitions of forgiveness. And I think this is where we get confused because there are some types of forgiveness that are entirely for the victim and they have nothing to do with the person, the perpetrator. And the perpetrator doesn't know, that's not important at all. And so there's that personal forgiveness where like, I don't want to carry this anymore. I'm going to choose to forgive them in my own heart so I can move on. And I think we talk about that a lot and that's become very popular. But there's also the forgiveness of, I think a lot of people think that forgiveness equals welcoming someone into your life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not the same thing. Like you can, you can bear someone no ill will and still want to have nothing to do with them. And I think there's lots of different layers there. And I think we just throw this word forgiveness around. Like we all have the same definition. And I think, um, there's actually quite a, a lot of subtlety in there. Yeah. There's, I, I oh. don't think you need to forgive your your abuser to heal. I don't believe that. I believe that there are people who that is a helpful form of therapy for them, but I don't think that is something you do across the board. I think each person in their own healing, in their own therapy, needs to do what works for them. Mm -hmm. So you can't go and say, well, you know, you're not going to heal until you forgive. That might work for some people. It might not work for others. Healing is a personal journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I was just going to say that um, my father is an abuser. He's also a human being, right? So it took me a long time to see his humanity. Um, <laughs> and it took me a long time to admit that I have parts of him in me. That mm -hmm. took me forever, it felt, to admit that. My father was a brilliant storyteller. A brilliant storyteller. So if I have storytelling abilities, that comes from my father. So my father, although he's an abuser, he was he's also a human being um, with, you know, some goodness in him. And that can be really, really hard to see. So as much as I don't forgive him, I do see him as a human being. And I do see him as having some good parts as well as, as his failings. Hmm. Which... You know, I, I was I've been thinking about the title of this, "The Devil's Daughter," and I when, you know, from a spiritual connotation, the idea of the devil is there's there's some charm in him. I mean, you mentioned already earlier in the podcast, you talked about how he would hand in hand you kittens mm -hmm. and cats, mm -hmm. and that seems like such a playful thing. But yet, what else did he do? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's like we. We, we think like abusers aren't just like they don't wake up one more. It's not only about what they do that is bad. It is what they do that is good that keeps you trapped into the bad. Yes. Because that's the mind conflict, I think, that goes on. Yep. Abusers often learn how to be charming, hmm. right? How to manipulate, hmm. how to make you know, how to say things in such a way that they turn circles around you and so you land up feeling confused. Mm -hmm. And and you know, that's part of that's part of their game. Mm -hmm. Right? That's part of what they do. Um and my father was charming and a brilliant storyteller and could tell jokes and he could be very funny and very lovely. And he liked watching, you know, comedy on T V and we could sit and watch comedy and laugh our heads off together forever. But then he'd turn around and, and rampage. And I think the devil's daughter, the name of the play, comes from the way that young Melody saw her father. And we see we see her progress through through the play. So in the beginning it's very black and white, it's very much he is the devil and 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 then when we get kind of closer to the middle and, and as she becomes a teenager, she starts to see bits of her, him in her. And there's there's some beautiful scenes where there's a little bit of overlap and you're you know, you can see that there's, um, we were working on this last night, um, but you can see that that she's taken on some of, of him and she's been influenced by him. And I think it's really interesting that journey from, from seeing him as the devil and then seeing herself as part of that. And then, and then what she chooses to do with that afterwards as well. But yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Is there anything else specifically within the play that we need to talk about? No, just remember, you know, I'd love you to come see it. Uh, remember, there are, you know, trigger warnings. So if you are still dealing with trauma mm -hmm. and you're likely to be triggered, um, then, then you know, save it for next time. We've done our best to deal with it very gracefully. So mm -hmm. it's not one of those plays where there's lots of shouting all the time. No, no, no. But if there is a certain thing that may trigger you, there's, there's quite a, 
there's quite a, a variety of different types of, of violence um, and, and abuse yeah. that are touched on. They're not yeah. necessarily, you don't always go deep enough. Like Including self-harm. Yes. Just to put that out there. It's not just, it's not just, uh, you know, harm to others. There's also yeah. self-harm. So just, just to put it out there. Mm. Yeah. And if you're, and if you're at all curious and you think you really want to see the play, but um, if you really want to see the play, but you aren't sure if you'll be triggered, ask us. Uh, Melanie and I are both very open. We're very easy to access. Yes. We have Facebook page and all that kind of stuff for the for the show. So if you want to see the show, but you're just not 100% or you want to bring someone and you're not 100%, just chat to us because we obviously have an intimate knowledge of the show so we can tell you a little bit more about it. Yeah, and I check my Facebook messages and I accept, the, you know, if you ask me a question about the show, I will, you know, and if we're not friends, I'll accept your message and I'll answer you. I answer all comments. I respond to all messages that are about the show. No dating. Don't send me dating things. So if, if you're like a U.S. Army sergeant, no, that's not going to work. Come on, man. Stop this nonsense. But really, then come see the show. Real questions about the show, yeah. I'm on it. I'm there for you. Um, cause, okay, yeah. I, cause I, do, I do want to talk about the actual Vancouver French Festival as well. Because uh, one of the things that I'm going to play my... Uh, Alberta card here that I don't rarely play, but I'm going to play it here in this point. Um, as an almost official BC resident, uh, it's fascinating to me the notoriety that the Edmonton Fringe Festival gets compared to the Vancouver Fringe Festival. In that Vancouver, while Edmonton is considered an arts community, the Hub, one of the hubs, Canadian hubs of entertainment, is Vancouver. So I'm fascinated from your perspective. Do a lot of is the Vancouver Fringe Festival getting the notoriety that it deserves? And I'm not asking it to say I'm not asking to say it's better than the. I think there's there's two different things in terms of which was better. That's that's not my point. I think the recognition of the artists that are working on the Vancouver French Festival. I think it depends what you mean. And I mean, the Canadian French does go across Canada. And so there's there's that. And, but as far as Vancouver as a city goes, it's interesting because there were loyal, there's a huge loyal French following and they're amazing. And a lot of the city doesn't even know what's happening. And I think that's partially because it, it is quite insular. Traditionally, it's mostly been on Granville Island. It has now opened up um, and we have uh, venues at the Cult and stuff as well and the Havana and, you know, various bring your own venues around town. But I think it hasn't really seeped into the general consciousness of people in the city. It's not something that is kind of advertised, I think, maybe in like what to do in Vancouver so much. But the the fringe family, like the, the community that comes to fringe, they're amazingly loyal. They they're fantastic. But it is funny how you could almost separate the population of Vancouver in early September. There are there are people who fringe and people who don't. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the people who don't don't usually don't even know it exists. You know, I'll I'll go on the bus with my lanyard on and people are like, oh what's going on? <laughs> like, how do you not know there's a fringe festival <laughs> happening? Um so it's yeah, that's not like Edinburgh, it's not like a huge, huge fringe festival, but we are pretty big now. And I think I think we could do to tell more people who like theater or even people who are curious about theater because the fringe is a fantastic gateway drug. You know, if people don't think of themselves as theater people, the fringe is a great way to experience different types of performance art without having to think of yourself as a theater person if you don't want to. Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. So, yeah, I, I there's a, because there probably is a lot of new people or un- I don't want to say un I'm going to use the word untheatered, but it's not, they're not regular theater goers, right? But um, how has the Vancouver Fringe F F Festival and community supported you, too? Uh, <laughs> they're amazing. I've done the Fringe many times. Um, Melody and I have both reviewed uh, through a magazine that is now currently in hibernation, but um, the Theater Addicts, uh, we reviewed every single show at the Fringe last year, which is amazing. We'll be coming back in 2021. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, it's, oh, the fringe is fantastic. It's the, the artists are fantastic. The, the volunteers are fantastic. The audience is fantastic. The food trucks are fantastic. <laughs> um, I've, I've performed, not performed, I've produced there as well, directed other shows there. 
And the thing that I find amazing is that everyone is so supportive. There's very much not in Vancouver the rest of the time necessarily, but at Fringe, all the artists is very much about collaboration, not competition. Mm -hmm. Which isn't always the same the rest of the year round. Sometimes it is. Um, but it's it's amazing how everyone just bands together and it's it's like being war buddies or something, you know, like you did the fringe together, there's a there's an immediate bond with anyone who's wearing a fringe lanyard, whether you know them or not, you feel like family. It's really mm -hmm. cool. Um if not for fringe, I wouldn't be performing this. Plain and simple. I mean, if we're not for Fringe, I wouldn't be performing this. They are, they've given the, the structure, you know, the ticketing, um, uh, I found a venue through them. If not for Fringe, I would, we would be finding our own venue, finding our own ticketing system, like all the things that feel absolutely impossible, Fringe is doing. And so if it weren't for them, I, I wouldn't be doing this. I mean, that, and that's the, that's the, the the logistics of it right the practical side of it the other side is if not for fringe um i wouldn't be doing this because fringe is the place where people like me get to play and get to experiment mm -hmm. and get to try things out mm -hmm. and you know i've i've worked really hard for this of you know writing it i took a course on how to do a solo show i've had two people dramaturge i've written and written and revised and revised and edited i've worked really really hard on this and I'm incredibly grateful that there is a place in Vancouver where I get to go and and perform this. Because if not for Fringe, honestly, this play wouldn't be happening. And that is the wonderful thing about the Canadian Fringe is that it's a lottery system. So we actually didn't get into the lottery, and we're bringing our own we're bringing our own venue. But there's still so much support and so much structure around it. There's no way we'd be able to uh, self produce this outside of Fringe, um, not on the, the budgets that we have. But um, that's the wonderful thing about the lottery system is that all you need is an idea. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so, that makes it so exciting because in the regular world, if you want to produce a show, you need a certain amount of capital, you need a certain amount of reputation. You, you know, there's so much work that goes into it. Not that there isn't a lot of work that goes into doing a fringe show, but at least makes it possible for people who want to experiment, want to try something new. So yeah. that's the wonderful thing about attending fringe is that you get to see this huge variety, internationally recognized artists, artists who've never been on in a show before, young artists, older artists, uh, artists from every walk of life, and it's just so amazingly accessible. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in turn, I want to actually, you brought up that you were reviewers, mm -hmm. um, and there often can be controversy around reviewing. So <laughs> I, I, I do want to touch on What's the difference between a good review and a bad review? And from a performer's perspective, how do you balance the good and the bad reviews? So a good review is about the audience, not about the reviewer. A good review educates the audience on what type of show it is, what type of people might like to see it, whether or not it is what's advertised on the can, because fringe show descriptions are written way before the show sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it what it what it advertises itself to be? And yes, of course, there's opinion in there, but it's it should be owned. Subjective opinion should be owned. So I don't like this because I don't like blah. If you like blah, you will like it, for example. Um, there are certain things that I will always bitch about as a reviewer, like if uh, production standards aren't at a certain level like if the actors don't know their lines for example i'm always going to complain about that because i think that's something that's really like step one <laughs> it's a basic but it's basic but there's a lot of things on taste and reviewing has taught me when i was a young acting student uh i thought there was good theater and bad theater and reviewing has taught me so much that there are good production values and bad production values like there's there's, there's people who aren't dedicated to their craft but so much of it is taste and you've really got to own your subjectivity so that you can help because the review isn't about you saying, you know, passing judgment on a show. That's not what a review is about. A review is about helping the audience decide if they want to see it, because I don't know how many there are this year, but last year there were more than a hundred shows in the festival mm -hmm. and it's only 10 days. So <laughs> you can't see everything. So the reviews are very important in helping the audience know what they want to see. And it's about that. And if you keep that in mind, it's a lot easier. Obviously, you don't want to like do the whole plot because that again, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to detract from the show. But helping people understand what type of people might enjoy it, helping people understand what kind of genre it is, that kind of thing is, mm -hmm. and giving context to the show. 
I think that's what a good re good review does. Melody? Yeah, I I agree. I think that when I when I was reviewing last year and in the years past when I've reviewed, I wanted to think about um, not just whether I liked it or not, but who would like it and what kind of audience was there and and being um, gracious to the you know being as gracious as you can to the cast right and to the producer and the director recognizing the hard work that goes into it and realizing that just if you don't like it doesn't mean that nobody will like it I have um, and, and I think for the most part you know that's that's the most important thing there are times when something happens where um, you think you know the audience is disrespected or mm. like something big is happening and it's you know you can't ignore it um, and you but you have to be really sure that it wasn't just you <laughs> when you write about it you know so I've had shows where I felt wow that's just disrespectful to the audience mm. and you know I wanted to be able to say something about that without you know without saying well I didn't like you know I, there are definitely been shows that I've hated and have said so, but I do my best to keep that separate from, you know, like, this is my opinion and like owning that so the people can separate that from how the actual show. So this is what the show is about. This is who it's for. This is my personal opinion on it. And mm -hmm. sometimes I don't like things and, and that's okay. Not everything is for everybody. Right. Yeah. And that's important too. Yeah. But, we're on, we're, but there's a difference between that and a hot takes like, this was just a piece of crap. Yeah. Well, that's not constructive and yeah. it doesn't tell anyone anything. Yeah. It, that's not helpful. You got to say why you don't like something. Yeah. But I hated it. Okay, great. Yeah. Why? Yeah. <laughs> that's about the reviewer. Yeah. yeah. Not about the, yeah. the reviewer. And, the... Mm. I know. So yeah, I thought, cause there, there can be some controversy around mm -hmm. reviewing. Mm -hmm. So we definitely had our fair share of controversy around reviewing. <laughs> we, we don't need to get into that. Nope. It? No, it's uh <laughs> Uh, so tell us where to watch, how to find, contact. Um... Uh, yeah, so it's at the Arts Umbrella, which is on Granville Island. It is a bring your own venue. So we're, we are near the back of the Fringe program. We're on page 58, I believe. Um, obviously, the Fringe, VancouverFringe.com is the best place to get tickets. You can also get tickets at the door. Uh, I, I believe at the, the door of the venue, 45 minutes before the show starts, and then before that, you just go to the regular ticketing booth if you'd rather do things that way in person. And what else do we need to know? We've got a Facebook group. Uh, we've got a group and a page because we just, you know, we like do. to overdo things. Mm -hmm. um, so the page is Crooked Tea Theater. That's my, my theater company. The, the Facebook page is Crooked Tea Theater. And then we have a group called The Devil's Daughter at the Fringe. Um, what else do we need to know? Come see it. It's different times every, yeah. every yeah. day. It's a Half price time. ticket show, oh. though, is the first. So Fringe starts on Thursday, the 5th of September. And on Friday, the 6th of September, we have a show at, I believe, quarter to 10, 9.45. Yes. 9 that yeah. is our half price show. So if you want to see theater on a budget, come to that one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, that's great. And then contact Danielle and Melody for more. Uh, I may have an idea after the podcast for you guys, but we'll talk about that after. Awesome. Um, and if, yeah, so check that out. Uh, are you guys on Instagram? I'm on Instagram. Melody's on Instagram. Oh, Melody Ann. O-M-E-L-O-D-Y-A-N-N. -N, oh, Melody Ann. I'm on Facebook, Melody Owen. Uh, I'm on Twitter, O oh, Melody Ann. I'm fairly easy to find, <laughs> so if you if you want to look for me, just Facebook Melody Ann or Twitter Instagram O Melody Ann. If you have any questions, you want to reach out to me for any reason, please do. Okay. I'm happy to hear from you, and um, yeah, happy cool. to see you there. I was going to say, hope to see you there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, of course, with me again, you can follow me at K E V O L E Spreaker dot com K E V O L E as you find all podcasts. Uh, agree or disagree with the podcast on Facebook. You can like Twitter, Instagram, etc. So if you did not hear on Saturday, I'll just reiterate this again. So for the last year, we've been doing a hockey edition every Saturday. Uh, and it's been fun. And we are going to continue to do that. But it will not be on Agree or Disagree the podcast because it is a different platform. So we are going to be creating its own podcast, the working titles, the hockey podcast. Some like it, some don't. It's an interesting name, but whatever, where I bought the domain and fits with that, but we'll figure that out. We'll have its own page, its own Patreon, things like that. I will be setting up a Patreon for this because I'm a poor starving student. 
So uh, I will be doing that as well. So you'll be able to check that out. But thank you guys very much for taking the time, uh, getting me here. Sorry, it was late. <laughs> and go check out the show, and we will talk to you all soon. Bye for now. Just like a has its down. Just like a cowboy sings a sad, sad song.